хотите, чтобы я понимал? Русский мир – это все поколения наших предков и наши потомки, которые будут жить после нас. От этого поколения зависит и будущее русского мира. Для нас русский мир – это не этническое понятие. Русский мир включает в себя и все народы, принадлежащие к другим религиям. Благослови, душа моя, Господа! Русский мир – это Russian world is the borders of Russian civilization, which is, by definition, inclusive. It contains a great variety of different societies. That is to say, it is an inclusive Russian civilization, which primarily includes the Eastern Slavs. So, we are talking about the Russian world, which contains the Little Russians and the Belarusians. Because when we identified only the Great Russians with the Russians, the Muscovites, we limit the concept of Russian, because Belarusians considered themselves Russian. There were no Belarusians, but inhabitants of Belarus and the inhabitants of southwestern Russia, where Ukraine is now. So there are at least three branches, although there are also other distinct Rus, with complex processes that took place in this Russian world. But in any case, these are the Eastern Slavs, the exact definition of the Russian world, the core of the Russian world. That's why it's called Russian. But at the same time, since it is an inclusive reality, an inclusive civilization, which integrates other ethnic and cultural groups, as this Russian world expanded, and it has been a long time, since the very beginning, since Kievan Rus, other non-Slavic peoples of all kinds, Circassians, North Caucasians, Turks, Finno-Ugrians, they became, from the earliest stages of the formation of the Russian state, an integral parts of this Russian world. The Finno-Ugric tribes, along with the Eastern Slavic tribes, invited Rurik. Our chronicle begins when the Finno-Ugrians and Eastern Slavs invited the Germans. Maybe with Varangians too. Perhaps among the genealogy of these Varangians, there were also ethnic elements from Western Russia. But that's another story. Currently, it's the Norman theory that is debated. That is to say, from the very beginning, the Russian world was formed inclusively. These were the Eastern Slavs, who attracted more and more other peoples and other ethnic groups into their zone of historical existence. And gradually, the expansion of this Russian world reached at certain times such proportions that it included both Poland and Finland, and vast territories to the east and south. In my opinion, the Russian world is not an ideology. It is primarily a kind of unifying idea. In other words, it is a kind of spiritual support or pillar of the nation. It is the gathering of the Russian man, of Russians, who can live in Russia, live outside its borders, and not be Russian at all but who share the values of tradition and principles that characterize Russia as a state and as a civilization, meaning Russia as a kind of spiritual core, as a bastion of traditional, healthy, normal values common to all humanity. The first time the Russian world as an expression is mentioned in historical sources, is in the major works of ancient Russian literature from the 11th century. And this mention appears in a context related to Crimea, since in the ancient Russian state often called Kievan Russes. There was a cult of a common Orthodox saint, Clement, a Pope of Rome. But that was before the division of the churches between Orthodox and Catholic. So the Saint Clement was imprisoned in the territory of Crimea. He was persecuted by the pagan Roman state of that time, and he suffered martyrdom there, somewhere in the region of actual Sevastopol, where the ancient city of Chersonesus is located, where later Prince Vladimir would convert to Orthodoxy. 
And in this work called Discourse on the Restoration of the Church of the Tithe, and the Church of the Tithe is the first stone-built Orthodox Church, it was in Kiev. There is a mention of the transfer of St. Clement's holy relics from Chersonese to Kiev. And it says, his name is the light of the crosses, which spread throughout the world, throughout the Russian world. Therefore, it is very important to understand that the Russian world is Kiev, Crimea, and that it is a common Russian cult of a common Christian saint. And later, in several works of ancient Russian literature, this term will be frequently mentioned, and later philosophers and writers will use it. For example, the famous novel by Fyodor Dostoevsky, Notes from a Dead House, in which he describes his path to forced labor, was published in a newspaper called The Russian World. And today, of course, the Russian world acts as a sort of civilizational doctrine that shapes the space of Russian culture and Russian history, which are higher and wider than the contemporary borders of the Russian Federation. So, where Russians live, where the Russian soul exists, and where there is Russian culture, there the Russian world is. It's a world that is truly unique and which has indeed managed to survive by virtue of its specificity. And in fact, it cannot be entirely westernized, nor can it be entirely Asian. And precisely, there is a distinct literary and musical culture that is present here at the conservatory, of course. It's just in the land, you understand? It's in the steppe, it's in the forest, it's in the taiga. In fact, it's in these vast expanses that a unique form of thought emerges. And we return to this eternal question. Is it genetics that makes the people, or is it the land? I think it's a bit of both. And here we find ourselves in the presence of a culture that is both continental and hyperborean. Vladimir Putin himself said that the only ideology that should exist in Russia is patriotism. It's still interesting to mention. And he has always spoken out against any messianism. He also said that he hoped neither the Russian elites nor the Russian people would ever have a messianic idea. Once again, the only ideology is the homeland, the love of the fatherland. And I would add, since we know that Vladimir Putin regularly refers to and makes others read Ivan Ilyin, who is a doctrinaire, and an ideologist of Russian patriotism and Russian nationalism. He wrote a collection called Our Tasks, in which he describes what nationalism means to him. It is not a nationalism, as Putin himself says, a cave nationalism, which makes you want to kill your neighbor and invade them, but it is a contemplation of the action of one's people in history before God. Thus taking into account both successes and accomplishments, and there have been great ones for France and for Russia, for these millennial nations, and also its flaws and taking responsibility for its failures and mistakes. So, I think this is the vision that Putin tries to convey, since precisely, our Tasks is one of the three books he had distributed to senior officials in 2016. So, the Russian world is a belonging to a civilization that took root at the end of the first millennium. And which is deeply rooted in orthodoxy, since the birth act of Kievan Rus, and thus of the Russian nation, is the year 988, a year after Hugh Capet was elected king. So, we have quite parallel histories, even though the birth of the French nation dates back a bit further with the baptism of Clovis. In Europe, often, the baptism of the prince is the recognized act of the nation's birth. 
This is the case in Poland, it is the case in Russia, and it is something fundamental. It links faith with the nation on which it is built. So yes, I think Russia is a civilization state. This is the term used today because it has the longevity. For me, there are four aspects that make a nation and the strength of a nation. It takes a people. It takes a state, it takes a territory, and it takes longevity. France has these four attributes almost to perfection. And for Russia, it is a bit more complicated, notably because the capital has changed a lot. With us, the capital has almost always been in Paris, apart from very short moments in history. In Russia, it started in Veliky Novgorod, then it moved to Kiev. Then it moved to Galich, to Vladimir, then to Moscow, it then moved to St. Petersburg, and then back to Moscow. But there has always been a state which, even when it was dysfunctional, existed. And there is, of course, a people, an immense people, which has even spread to the shores of the Sea of Japan. So yes, I think it is a civilization on its own, but I also think that of France. I think France is something really special. What is fundamental is longevity, and there are few nations that can boast and be proud of having this longevity, and of having had these four attributes, so regularly and so continuously. When it comes to ideology, one could say that yes, I think one must understand the rejection of ideology as posed by the current Russian constitution. It's a reaction to communism. The fall of the Soviet Union occurred under Western direction and support. The rejection of communist ideology was somewhat a mandatory requirement to receive the stamp of democratic country in 1990. This helps to explain it. However, this doesn't mean that there is no ideology in everyday life, simply because until about four or five years ago, even less, Neoliberalism was thriving, just like in all other countries around the world. Russia did not question it at all. Even now, in the third year of the war, we still see its traces and presence in daily life. So ideology does exist. The question is, which one? When we say there is no ideology, it simply means accepting the prevailing ideology. Currently, Russia is gradually attempting to establish an ideology that is more in line with its traditions and roots. This is where we have seen the emergence or re-emergence of the Russian world. The question of the Russian world is, in a way, a reminder to the collective unconscious, something that exists deep in the mind of every inhabitant of Russia, but not only of Russia. Because historical Russia is not the Russia within today's borders. For centuries, historical Russia corresponded to Central Asia and Eastern Europe. It was much larger. And the question can also be raised with regard to Armenia and Georgia, which for a long time were part of Russia in this historical and imperial dimension. So, the Russian world is both a historical dimension and a certain world view, and here we approach ideology. It is also a vision of man. It represents a certain scale of values that also opposes this global world. Therefore, there is both a positive project, traditional values, history, the Russian language, etc. And there is a negative project, involving the rejection of what is offered by the globalized West, which is no longer Europe anyway, because the culture offered today by Europeans has nothing to do with European culture. On the contrary, through this concept of the Russian world, Russia positions itself as the guarantor of this classic European culture that we have known since. It is our shared culture, our shared civilization. <laughs>
Московской единым хозяином отныне буду я. Один. Everyone thinks Ivan the Terrible was a cruel man, and many related to the Oprichnina gave negative results. Also, it turned out to be not a panacea, but he stood in front of the end of the world. In other words, he took responsibility for the Katahon, and it is an extremely terrible period. It is a period during which you stand alone and are responsible not only for all the people, but for all of humanity and the entire universe, alone before God, with no one to lean on. You understand that the attention of subjects are constantly worried about minor and secondary issues about betrayal, greed, ambition, competition, hatred. But Ivan the Terrible's acute understanding, and I think partly Stalin's at his time, who shoulders the role of a great and universal leader, as befits a ruler of Rus, in a specially chosen area of the world, of the universe, tragic and very eschatological and alarming at the same time. All of this obviously creates enormous tensions, which can be expressed through good reforms, through incorrect reforms, through cruelty, or, conversely, through passivity. The concept of Third Rome emerged when the Second Rome fell. Moscow began to feel and perceive itself as the last guardian of the true faith. For people of the Middle Ages, at the time this concept was born, this was the most important thing. What is your mission? Your mission is to serve Christ and to serve the true faith because it is only by remaining faithful to your faith that you can save your soul and that of others. Moscow felt itself in some way as the guardian of orthodoxy, the protector of the world against the advent of the kingdom of the Antichrist. This conception was of such magnitude, the conception of the Third Rome. Notice that it was born in a distant monastery, in Peskov, where a starets, a mystic monk lived who corresponded with the Russian Tsar. He compared Moscow, and by that he meant the entire Russian state, to a protector of the entire Christian world against the enemies of all humanity. From this point of view, when we talk about the Third Rome, we are talking about a religious doctrine. This is not even geopolitics. In any case, it is not pure geopolitics. It is certainly not in favor of aggression or imperialism or the annexation of lands. It concerns the protection of life on earth, in the literal sense of the term. Because it is only by preserving our way of life, by preserving humanity in man, but humanity as a creation in the image and likeness of God, only in this way can you protect, and only in this way can you feel like the Third Rome, and only in this way. That is why, when they try to accuse us of being imperialists, all of this is just insinuations and disinformation. The concept of the Third Rome was born as a religious one. The idea of Moscow Third Rome is not just a glorification of Russia, it is also the future, but a very tragic future, because in the future, the idea of Moscow Third Rome announces a collision with the Antichrist and the movement towards the end of the world. That is to say, the empire is eternal, it always holds, but at some point, it comes to an end. It is eternal in relation to time. But in relation to God, it is instantaneous like the world. The universe is the world. In other words, it's the cosmos. It always exists, as long as there is something of being, but being itself is not eternal. Being is thus eternal in terms of the time of existence, but it is nothing before God.
And this dual status of the world or the universe is a dual creation. On one hand, they exist as long as there is something, and on the other hand, in the eyes of God, it was created. Meaning, it did not exist before and will not exist after, which predetermines the tragedy of the imperial vision of the world. There has always been an empire, but in the final era of the world, it will collapse because the world itself will collapse. Not because the empire will collapse and the world will remain. With the empire, the world will collapse too. There will be a short period of rule by the Antichrist, the Dajjal for Muslims, and then the end will come. So to prolong the existence of the universe, it is necessary to protect the empire. That's exactly the Katahon. Yet, there is something that keeps this from happening now, and you know what it is. At the proper time then, the wicked one will appear. The mysterious wickedness is already at work, but what is going to happen will not happen until the one who holds it back is taken out of the way. For the famous German jurist, Karl Schmitt, the Katerhon is a force that holds back the end of the world. It is the instance or force that restrains evil, thus preventing the final victory of the Antichrist. Due to its dual nature, it cannot be solely spiritual and also implies a force of political action. According to Carl Schmitt, the Katahon must be named for each era in the last 1,148 years. The place has never been unoccupied. Otherwise, we would no longer be here. For the Eurasians and the Russian Orthodox Church, today, Russia fulfills the role of the Katahon. Из человеческой жизни, из жизни общества. Мы знаем, что это охватило вначале Западную Европу, Америку, а потом и Россию. Но сегодня с новой и новой силой, уже в масштабах целой планеты, развивается эта идея жизни без Бога, и мы видим, как предпринимаются усилия, в том числе на законодательном уровне во многих процветающих странах, законом утвердить люб право любого выбора человека, в том числе и самого греховного, идущего вас в разрез со Словом Божиим, с понятием святости, с понятием Бога. И как результат опасное явление в жизни современного человечества. Это явление получило название дехристианизация. И, наверное, эти бы философские взгляды нельзя было бы назвать ересью, если бы очень многие христиане не приняли эти взгляды и не отдали приоритет человеческим правам более, чем Слову Божьему. И поэтому мы сегодня говорим об глобальной ересе человека поклонничества, нового идолопоклонства, исторгающего Бога из человеческой жизни. И ничего подобного в глобальном масштабе никогда не было. И именно на преодоление этой ереси современности, последствия которой могут иметь прямые апокалиптические события, сегодня церковь и должна направлять силу своей защиты, силу своего слова, силу своей мысли. А все это мы формулируем очень просто – Мы должны защищать православие. And that's the meaning of the idea of Moscow as the Third Rome. And this idea is quite tragic. It's dramatic and eschatological. It's linked to the end of times.
Last year, the conception of Moscow as the third Rome celebrated its 500th anniversary since Staritz Philotheus formulated these ideas, according to which Moscow is the successor of the Byzantine tradition. More than that, it would be the true heir of the Orthodox faith. This idea was formulated and is inextricably linked to the idea of royal power, despite the fact that Europeans did not want to recognize this title for the Russian Tsars. Similarly, later on, they would not want to recognize the title of Emperor for Peter the Great. These same French people would only recognize this title of Emperor several years after the proclamation of the Russian Empire because for them, the heir to imperial power could only be Western Europe, not Eastern Europe. Moreover, when the idea of Moscow as the Third Rome was formulated, it was, to some extent, marginal even in Russia. Why? Because Staritz Philotheus was a Staritz of Pskov, and Pskov is not Moscow. In other words, it was not a central power structure. But this idea would be particularly accepted in Russia during the 19th and 20th centuries, just as Eurasian ideas began to develop. For it was again about seeking a kind of national identity in response to global, world and European crises. The Russians also sought themselves at this time through a kind of national fervor, and that is why this idea of Moscow as the Third Rome became very prevalent and very popular, particularly among the representatives of Slavophilism and similar currents, which emphasized a kind of of uniqueness and special originality of Russia. But in the West, this was precisely perceived as an indicator of the supposed eternal Russian expansionism with an additional orthodox coloration. The Symphony of Powers if we approach it from a historical point of view, it's a concept that appeared in a very difficult time for Russia. It's the restoration of the patriarchy in the 17th century. During the time of the Tsar Alexis Mikhailovich and Patriarch Nikon, between whom there were very difficult relations and unfortunately it was the kind of relations that led to a very deep crisis in Russian Orthodoxy in connection with the Russian Orthodox schism, the Raskol. However, notice that the schism happened largely because during the reunification between Little Rus, which is today called Ukraine, and Great Rus, that is Russia, many of the religious canons that through Little Rus were borrowed from the West came to Russia because for a long time Little Rus was under the influence of Poland and Catholicism. All of this started to be imported into orthodoxy and a dispute, we might say, a bookish one, led to a very serious crisis. Generally, crises occur like this because of seemingly distant disputes related to the dogma of faith. And it's particularly at this moment that we apparently move towards, I say apparently, towards this symphony of powers. That's to say towards a power that is spiritual, religious and state, that of the Tsar's power. What does this tell us? There is a very fine line here. You can violate it because of your pride, and Patriarch Nikon had blinding pride when a person endowed with spiritual power wanted more. However, he went, was seduced, not knowing that by doing so, he followed the Western path. And today, perhaps, the relationship between the President and the Patriarch among us represents in some way a hope. Because in Russia, and it is surprisingly a Soviet tradition, when religion was banned and separated from the state, this tradition is preserved in the sense that among us, the church and the state, and this contrary to the old Russian Empire, are separated from each other. But at the same time, they cooperate and interact. And it is probably this form of interaction which is extremely important from the point of view of consolidating society. <laughs> 
Due to the Byzantine heritage, the idea of a symphony of powers, the idea of Caterhorn, the Tsar, as the executor of the religious, global and universal mission aimed at preventing the coming of the Antichrist, all these ideas came to us from Byzantium. And this idea was known before the fall of Byzantium. That's to say, this is how we perceived the Byzantine Empire. But when Byzantium collapsed, and even before, when it abandoned the Orthodox foundations and accepted the Florentine Union in 1438, it went to bow to the Pope, renouncing its identity. And after that, it lost its state status under the attacks of the Ottomans. Therefore, during this period, the idea of Moscow Third Rome was formed, that the Third Rome migrated to Moscow, and Moscow is now the heir of Rome, not just of Byzantium, but of Rome, of the entire Roman Empire, and Rome in turn was the heir of the Greek kingdom, and Greece the heir of the Achaemenids, and the Achaemenids are heirs of the Chaldean, Babylonian. Therefore, Russia became a world power from the point of view of status after the fall of Byzantium, remaining faithful to orthodoxy and asserting itself not as a grand duchy, but as a kingdom, as an empire. Russia not only took that, but also reworked it. And on the basis of both Byzantine influence and the influence of the Golden Horde and European influence, it precisely created what is generally called the Russian world. Here, as a negative example for European travelers, and for the French in particular, the symbol of Russia was St. Basil's Cathedral, located on Red Square in Moscow. But at the at the same time, no matter how they treated Russia, good or bad, they generally said it was a monstrous symbol, that it is a combination of incompatible things, it is an explosive mixture. That is to say, St. Basil's Cathedral with its many domes, of different levels, of different colours. This is how the Western man imagined Russia. But, in my opinion, it's here a question of synthesis, because it is evident that Russia has received a lot from Byzantium. Moreover, we converted to Christianity, Christianity in the form or Greek and Byzantine scheme. And on the one hand, the fact that Rus becomes Christian integrates us, Russia, among the Christian powers, and Russia becomes a full participant of the forming Europe, because at that time in the 10th century, Europe was not yet formed. It would form as a community facing the Ottoman threat, the Turkish danger. But it is precisely this factor of Russia's acceptance of Christianity, according to the Greek rite, according to the Eastern rite, which will become a factor at the origin of the fact that the West begins to consider Rus, and then Moscow Rus, not simply as other, but as foreign. That is to say, the Russians who accepted Christianity of the Eastern rite became for Western Catholics and later for Protestants, schismatics, separatists and heretics and generally non-Christians. And that's where the Crusades come from, that the Roman Catholic Church starts already from the 13th century against, as said in the papal bulls, against the schismatics, against the Russophones of Rus. And we choose precisely the Byzantine beginning, and that in the political system, and in our culture. First of all in culture, especially particularly in the Middle Ages, because culture was first and foremost religious. And we took this religious tradition, which at that time was not only a religious tradition, but it was religion, ideology, politics culture, but on the other hand, Russia was also open to some Western influences, since Russia and Russes, ancient Rus, could have converted to Christianity in its Western form, because a religious mission was indeed sent to Princess Olga. But Russia made a choice in favor of Eastern Christianity. Now perhaps we need this last Tsar, the last Tsar as the quintessence of our history. There are certain characteristics of this in Vladimir Putin. He is unquestionably the savior of Russia. He unquestionably lifted our country out of the abyss, simply out of the abyss. 
So he has every reason to be the supreme sovereign of our country, to be a monarch, and I am convinced of this. And many emperors of the Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire, they were simply identified, simply acclaimed by an enthusiastic mass. I think that's legitimate. He is already legitimate as a leader, but he could also be legitimate as a Tsar. He is already irreplaceable as a leader, but is he this last Tsar or not? This is an open question, because he has done much to bring about this last Tsar. But will he reveal himself, perhaps at the last moment, as such a figure? Or is he the herald of this character, of this last Russian monarch? That is the open question. So we live in this eschatological anticipation. Monarchy, it is perhaps the most current thing among the things happening in Russian politics today. It certainly cannot be the political parties, nor social movements, nor civil society. These institutions are either controlled by the state, if we talk about parties, or by Western intelligence, which has absolutely nothing to do with Russia's destiny. Therefore, only the highest monarchical power truly possesses sovereignty and freedom to influence in any way our destiny, that of our state, and of humanity as a whole. But this responsibility now weighing on Putin, I think it corresponds to that which weighed on Stalin and Ivan the Terrible, perhaps even more so, because upon his decision depends the existence or disappearance of humanity. We are on the brink of nuclear war, so in principle, a decision will have to be made at some point, and it is unlikely that we can escape it, that is to preserve or not life on Earth. And in such a situation, it is probable that neither Ivan the Terrible nor even Stalin found themselves in such a situation. That is why it is difficult to imagine the inner world of the leader of Russia at such a critical hour of world history, and not just ours. Without any pride and without arrogance, we still hope that maybe this experience and the very harsh current trials that are imposed on Russia as a whole, Holy Russia, the eternal Holy Russia, from the point of view of the terrible events in Ukraine, from the point of view of the harsh geopolitical conflict with the West, maybe despite all this, Holy Russia has gone through all these trials, all these battles, all these sufferings, through all this, a new form of state will be born, which will not be anti-human, which will take into account the original divine principle, the same luminous principle that is contained in the concept of the Russian world and in that of Moscow, the Third Rome. It's probably never useless to fight because we must at least understand that a strong Russia will be condemned to such an attitude. Because if Russia were weak, if Russia were so small, of course, there would be no Russophobia, because no one would need it. Yes, and it wouldn't matter, but Russia is big. Russia frightens by its size. It is a huge country with rich resources and rich potential, plus Russia, which can always unite and consolidate itself. And Europeans know very well that wars have always united Russia. And from each war, Russia has always emerged stronger. And besides, it is this Russian world that emerged and took its full measure precisely during confrontations. And now, the West sees this real Russian world, not those barbarians through whom they fantasized as being despots, marauders and rapists according to the Eastern Rite, as described by Napoleonic propaganda, but as completely different people, and from there precisely the attraction of the idea of the Russian world, and not only in Western Europe, but also well beyond. And concerning fighting against this type of anti-Russian propaganda, the Russian authorities, for example, have always been actively engaged in this area, including these information wars, mental wars, cognitive wars, the roots of which go back centuries and centuries. The Livonian War, when they used flying tracks during the Livonian War, it was already a prototype of current information wars. Also during the Northern War, between Russia and Sweden, 
It was the same with pamphlet wars, as they were called. Napoleon was even a master of political propaganda, and Napoleon literally demonized the image of the Russian soldier, the Russian Cossack. And moreover, contemporary Ukrainian or Western propaganda, it simply copied those images and stereotypes that were created by Napoleon. And moreover, after the publication of the Marquis de Costine's book, a newspaper war began between Russia and France. When the Russian authorities tried to publish under foreign names and in foreign newspapers, French, German, when they tried to publish denials, the Western citizen did not believe it. Why? Because people through the centuries have been used to such images, those of a demonic Russia. For example, Prince Vyazemsky refused to publish his refutation of Astolfo de Custine's book. Why? He replied that the French would not believe me. The French share the faith of their parish and the conviction of their newspaper. And in fact, it happens also today. The difference now is that while in the 19th century Russia had opportunities to promote its ideas in Western Europe, today, under conditions of a total Western blockade against any alternative opinion, we find ourselves compelled to act under increasingly difficult circumstances. Even Russia today, it does not have the possibility in Europe to broadcast its information. It can only do so outside the European continent, and even there, the influence is very limited. But it seems to me that the essential thing for us is to know this view, to understand that it did not appear now, that the West has always acted in this way for centuries, because thus we understand why this happens. Thus, we can react appropriately, or maybe if we do not find an antidote to it, because rossophobia is like a virus, a very contagious virus that spreads at the speed of a virus, but at least we can develop immunity against it. And probably the Russian world, it is exactly what gives us such a possibility. People, no matter what they do, are deeply rooted in Russian land. And I think the most poignant evidence of this sentiment lies with all the expatriates who continue to watch old films, old cartoons, who continue to speak Russian and live in a Russian way. Deep down, you can feel that they have this will and desire to return to Russian soil. There are political disagreements that can arise, or societal perceptions that may prevent them from returning, or they may return later. But you really feel that in the people who were born here, over several generations, whether abroad or here, this Russian land is so present within them. In Donetsk or Moscow, Murmansk or Vladivostok or Irkutsk, that you find the same character, the same way of being. And so it translates into literary, popular, musical culture, and everything you can associate with that. The Russian world is Russian, and we must embrace being Russian. The culture is Russian, and that's what attracts, that's the strength. And if Russia brings Kiev back, which is possible with political courage, it will then have the military means. If it has the political courage to bring Kiev back, then it will break a taboo. A taboo was established with the fall of the Soviet Union, as if history had started at that moment, as if these countries and these peoples had no connection with each other before. That is false. We can start by offering history lessons. We will then see that the Russian world exists. It exists geographically. It exists politically politically, humanly, socially, and it also exists economically nonetheless. So there is real potential, time is on its side, and that is why the other side is panicking, that's why it's frightening, because NATO countries are playing for their existence. They provoked this conflict in Ukraine, thinking they had already won with the dismemberment of the USSR and therefore of Russia. However, they have awakened Russia, and they have awakened Russians outside of Russia. There has indeed been an awakening and a reawakening.
Much will depend on this battle in Ukraine. It is not a war in Ukraine. It is a battle of a much larger war. If Russia wins this battle in Ukraine, then there will be a dynamic that will take place. And we already see in certain countries like Moldova that there is a real rapprochement of the political opposition elites because they understand very well that if they are Moldovan, they are with Russia, otherwise, in any case, they will be devoured by Romania. They don't want that, so time is currently on Russia's side for reconstruction. But whether the Russian political elites have the courage for the Russian world, but this is another story.